Our scripture passage today is from the book of Acts chapter 20. We are going to be looking at verses 17 through 20 or 38. And the message is farewell. Today is my last Sunday in this pulpit. Been 20 months. Been here for 20 months now. It's over a year and a half. And I use as my model this morning for my message, Paul's farewell sermon to the Ephesian elders in chapter 20, starting at verse 17. And I'm going to read this as I go through the message, but I want to start by reading verse 17 because it sets the stage for the message. From Miletus... He, meaning Paul, sent to Ephesus and called to him the elders of the church. And when they came to him, he said to them, and we'll go into what he said to them. Uh, Paul stopped at this little dying seaport village uh, called Miletus. And this is the ruins of Miletus today. It's in Turkey. And it is 36 miles south of Ephesus. And so what Paul was doing, he was asking the leaders, the elders uh, called the Presbyters of the church of Ephesus to travel 36 miles down to Miletus to meet him because Paul was on his way to Rome. He didn't want to go to Ephesus because it was out of his way. But furthermore, he was anxious to get to Rome. And if he went to Ephesus, he'd have to say howdy to everybody in the church. And that would take some time. And so he asked the elders of the church to meet him at Miletus. Now, Ephesus was a major city. My wife and I were there in 2016. This is a major thoroughfare in Exodus. It is also in Turkey, as I said, 36 miles above Miletus and you see the columns along the road and there were there's a roof over the road it was all covered and there were merchants and there were statuary and if you were a, a rich merchant you could have your own statue put along this road and notice that the road goes way down to the end and I don't know if you can see it very well but at the end there's a taller building it's the library of Celsus and from there, it makes a hard right turn, and it goes another quarter of a mile to the right. And again, there are shops and merchants and all of that, and it leads to the Colosseum. So this is at a lookout. Now you see the Library of Celsus a little closer, and all of the buildings. And to the right of that, there is this green mound, it looks like, and that is the beginning of the Colosseum. And then from the Colosseum, the road goes to the sea and where the sea merchants were located. This is the Colosseum. And it held 30,000 people. It was no small Colosseum. One of the largest of the day. You might be able to see some people in the Colosseum. There is one person standing what used to be the stage, but the, the top of the stage is missing. So he's standing on the floor and he's reading from the book of Ephesians to his daughter, which is standing on the uh, Colosseum uh, steps there. And I am taking the picture further up in the theater and all of us could hear him reading the book of Ephesians clearly. It was a magnificent stadium and Paul uh, was actually rescued by the Roman government here in this theater and taken into custody. And uh, it, uh, as the story goes on, Paul is referred to Rome. And so Paul is now looking to go to Rome. Ephesus was the New York City of that day. It was that big and that powerful. It was a major commerce center and it is where Paul spent his longest ministry, which was over three years. And now he is talking to the elders of the church of Ephesus back in Miletus. And he has some things to say to them. He has a speech that is charged with emotion because they have a relationship which is very close. 
Paul begins what he has to say in review, looking back. So let's read uh, actually the last half of uh, 18. He's now addressing the elders. You yourselves know how I lived among you all the time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials which befell me through the plots of the Jews. And how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable, teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance to God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. We'll stop there because that's his review. He's looking back at his ministry there in Ephesus. So he says... You yourselves know how I lived among you from the very first day. He's asking them to look back. And as we look back over the 20 months that uh, my wife and I have been with you and, and Keith and Debbie, I have now preached 83 sermons since coming to you. Today is the 83rd sermon. 29 of those were in quarantine where there were seven people that would meet on Friday afternoon and a camera was set up on a pew right here in front and I preached to that camera to you guys. I visualized you out there in the congregation. It was a challenge because we had never done that before. And pastors across the nation said the same thing. I have never preached to a camera before. 29 months. Uh, I mean, weeks, we did that. We were in quarantine. And then 54 months have been here in-house with people present in the sanctuary. The camera was moved to the back row. And uh, it was zoomed in over the heads of the people. And we learned to do a video ministry. There were seven people, as I said. There was Ron working the video camera and Jim that was working the sound and Vincent was controlling the computer which advanced the slides for the congregational singing. So that's all there were until we came back after 29 weeks and 54 more weeks now have been here in-house. We moved indoors in October 25th of 2020. Seems like a long time ago already. And we did so because churches all over the country were tired of the government telling them they couldn't meet in-house. And so they connected October 25th to Hebrews 10.25, which says, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some. And so the churches took a stand and we came back in-house, not neglecting to meet together. I want you to be encouraged to remember the positive things that have occurred in these 20 months. Things accomplished in the Lord. And I hope as you reflect that you will see that I tried to serve you in several ways, realizing that the Lord works through clay vessels. That's all I am. I'm a clay vessel and God has put his gospel in a clay vessel and he's... uh, called me to share that with you. I tried to serve humbly, and this is what Paul says in verse 19, serving the Lord with all humility. Then he mentions with tears and with trials, and we certainly had tears and trials, especially as COVID hit the church after two weeks after I came here. It was supposed to be a short interim ministry. I was told, you know, it'd just be for a short while, and then the the virus hit. And so here we are all these months later. And we went through tears and trials. People were afraid of COVID-19, and they stayed away. And they were supposed to stay away while we were in quarantine. And then we came back, but people were still afraid. They didn't know what to do. They were indecisive. We had trials with people confused what to do. Some wore masks, some didn't. And uh, some were indecisive about the vaccine when it came available. And so all of these things were going on in the congregation. And we prayed together for the sick when we couldn't meet. We used text messaging 
to pray for one another. And we learned to do a video ministry. So I tried to serve humbly. Then Paul says he uh, taught practically. I tried to teach practically. In verse 20, I, I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable. And so I tried to make my messages profitable for you. Bible study, after all, is my forte. I graduated from a seminary which calls itself a biblical seminary. It was the Mennonite Brethren Biblical Seminary. And so the Bible is important to me. I believe that God's word will not return void, but it will accomplish the purposes for which it goes out. I also tried to preach faithfully, and this is what Paul says in verse 21. I testified both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance to God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Churches want strong preaching. Not all pastors get it. Some pastors want to coast on other things besides preaching. My purpose was to leave people face to face with the living God through Jesus Christ. And that comes through preaching. My method was first of all to know the language and then to learn the author's meaning. You see, so many today have skipped the original languages and they read the English version and they go from the English words straight to how does it apply to me? And they don't talk about how the author wrote it what the author intended by it, his meaning, or any of that. They just go straight to application. But I was trained and I believe in my heart that we know, need to know the language in order to proclaim exactly what the Bible tells us. In the New Testament, that means we need to know Greek, the old Koine Greek of Paul's day. And we need to know what Paul means when he writes in Koine Greek before we make it live for today. The messenger is either a tour director or he is a pilgrim. A tour director knows the territory and he points out several things and then he moves on. A pilgrim is on a long journey. He lives it. It means something to him. Tour directors lose the wonder. Pilgrims are full of wonder in God's word. I preach as if four kinds of people are in the pews. I preach as if there is a theologian in the pews. And I believe that a theologian is going to call me to account and he's going to say, well, you got that wrong or what about this or that? So the theologians in the pews keep the message and the scholarship honest. And then there is the career type of person there are a lot of people that fall into this category because career people have nine to five jobs or eight to five, uh, whatever it is. They put a lot of energy into the workaday world. And they come home and they're dog tired and they've got chores at home and they come on Sunday and they want an uplifting message. They need hope. They need strength for the week. And so that's a large part of the congregation. And uh, then there are those people with limited abilities, those people that uh, uh, they're not so aware of other people. They get up and go to the restroom and create a disturbance and they get out their candy wrapper with the cellophane and they crinkle it and, and everybody looks and distracts from the message. When I was in my very first church, I was in seminary, I pastored an Advent Christian church in Fresno. And there was a guy, he's one of these kind of limited ability people. He would walk down the aisle and he would sit in the second pew right there. And as soon as I launched into my message, his head would fall back and he'd start to snore so loud that everybody in that small congregation was distracted. <laughs> and somebody would get up and tap him on the shoulder and wake him up. And this routine would go on two or three times during my message. Those kind of people are out there. And then there are the misfits of society. The kind that you would say, they don't belong in church. 
They've got the spiked hair. They've got the wrong clothes. They insist on the wrong styles. They want you to be noticed. They are challenging you to see if you love them enough to let them be in church. They say the wrong things. In fact, they might even say wrong or dirty words. I've had that happen. But all of these kinds of people come to church. And God wants me to have a message that will fit all of them. How do you do that? Fit all four kinds of people in one message. Well, it's hard to do, let me tell you. Furthermore, listening to sermons is not for everybody. Jesus said, let him who hears have ears to hear. And so not everybody is going to come with ears to hear. Some people who say sermons are boring also are bored by a powerful symphony or by a master painting. But we do not move ahead by looking at the past. We do not look into our rear view mirror in order to move ahead. The past is a rudder. It guides us to where we are today. And we are not to forget the past. Those who forget the past are doomed to repeat the past. And so we must take cognizance of the past. It's a rudder to guide us, but we cannot live in the rear view mirror. The past is not an anchor to draw us down or drag us down. And so Paul does not stay in the past in his message to the elders. He moves on to purview. This is today's challenge in verses 22 through 27. He says, and now behold, I am going to Jerusalem, bound in the spirit, not knowing what shall befall me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may accomplish my course and the ministry to, that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that you are all among you whom I have gone preaching to the gospel will see my face no more. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of you all, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. This is today's challenge, the purview. Purview means the scope or the extent of the ministry. So in verse 22, Paul returns to present circumstances. As we look at the present circumstances today, we are challenged with change. Change is all around us. We are facing change in this church. We have been challenged by COVID-19, for example, and that necessitated a lot of change. We are challenged by changes in our culture. This is not your father's world anymore. We are challenged by changes in this church. This church is going through some changes that will challenge each and every one of us. As we face our present circumstances, let these words from Paul be our guide. Paul says, run by faith in verse 22. He says, I'm going to Jerusalem bound in the spirit, not knowing what shall befall me there. Paul doesn't know. He hadn't got a clue. All he knows is that it might be something that will be harmful to him. But he's going there by faith. He sets his course by faith, not knowing what will happen when he gets there. You and I don't have a clear idea of what's going to happen next here in this church either. We don't know what lies ahead. We do believe that God is not through with this church yet. When we tell ourselves that we can never change, we presume too much and we believe too little. Let's let that soak in. When we tell ourselves that we can never change, we presume too much and believe too little. The next thing Paul tells us in verse 24 is run for Christ. 
He says, but I do not count my life of any value nor as precious to myself. Paul's ambition is to finish the race, which he says in 2 Timothy 4, 7, he did. At, at the end of his career, he writes to this young pastor named Timothy, and he tells him, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. As a result, he continues, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. And not only to me, but to all who have loved his appearing. There is laid up a crown of righteousness to all of us who are faithful, who finish the race. A crown of righteousness which we will receive on that day. Be sold out to Jesus Christ in the coming days and weeks. Don't be intimidated by suffering. Don't be intimidated by sacrifice. Don't be intimidated by change. Run the race, run for Christ. And then Paul says, run for the finish line in verse 24. If only my, I may accomplish my course and the ministry which I received from the Lord to win the prize, we must finish well. They don't give out medals to those who give up. They don't give out medals to those who don't cross the finish line. Run for the finish line. Our ministry is to spread the gospel. Paul tells us about that gospel. The gospel is God's undeserved favor for mankind, for guilty sinners. God sent his son from heaven. His son willingly gave up his robes of glory in heaven, humbled himself, came to earth as a man, and died on a cross for you and I. He suffered on a cross, he bled on a cross, he died on a cross so that those who believe on him will receive forgiveness of sin and everlasting life. In the 1960s, America had a wonderful moonshot. The 1960s moon landing with Neil Armstrong. My wife and I can remember it well. We went to our college classroom at the First Baptist Church of Fresno. We took a TV and we set it up in that room in a Sunday night and we watched as Neil Armstrong got out of the, the spaceship and set his foot on the moon. There was a family that was watching. They were engrossed in the landing, watching it on television and their daughter entered the room, a young daughter, and she said, I want to see Howdy Doody. To her, Howdy Doody was more important than mankind's dream of the centuries. And often we are concerned with Howdy Doody matters rather than God's dream of the eons, saving the lost and growing their faith. This is today's challenge. Run by faith. Run for Christ. Run for the finish line. Paul continues with a preview of what lies ahead, starting at verse 28. Take heed to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to care for the church of God, which he obtained with the blood of his own son. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who were with me. 
In all things I have shown you that by so toiling, one must help the weak, remembering the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. This is what lies ahead. In verse 25, Paul says to these elders, as a group, they would never see Paul again. So what lies ahead here? What is going to happen after I fade away? Paul offered a mixed bag about the future. He pointed to some negative things that could occur. He said people would try to divide the church. People would try to destroy the church. People would try to deceive the church. And he warns the elders, be ready, be watchful, look out. I am not predicting the hostile takeover of First Baptist Church. But I do know that Satan is our enemy. And Satan is the enemy of the church. And therefore, he is the enemy of this church. And I do say along with Paul, watch out, be wary. Satan's will work uh, over time to destroy this church in this period of transition. He will work over time to destroy this church. Don't let him try. You have the power of Almighty God on your side. And you can be victorious if you focus on what he calls this church to do. Three practical words of advice come from Paul in this passage. In verse 32, he says, build each other up in Christ. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up. This is what I am doing this morning. I'm seeking to build you up. I'm committing you to God, not to a human leader. I'm committing you to God. I'm committing you to God's word. It is God's word that is able to build you up. Let God through his word guide you in all that you do in the future. Second, Paul says, build others for Christ. In verse 35, he says, In all things I have shown you that by so toiling, we must help the weak. He means the physically weak. He means the morally weak. He means the spiritually weak. We are to help the weak. You are not building up this church to build up your needs. You are servants seeking the good of others, of one another. I think of the Good Samaritan story. Jesus told a parable of the Good Samaritan. He said there was a man on his way from Jerusalem to Jericho, and I've been on that road, and it's a treacherous road with deep drop-offs in the ravines. And the man fell among robbers, and they left him half dead. And then a fellow Jew came along the way, and they saw him and walked on the other side of the road. And even a Levite, a, a priest, saw the man and walked on the other side of the road. And then a Samaritan, a half Jew, whom the Jews looked down upon, they were not racially pure, and so the Jews had a racial problem with the Samaritans. And this Samaritan picked him up and put him on his mount and carried him to an inn at the end of the road and paid for his stay there. And he said, if he's got any other needs, I'll pay for that as well. And then Jesus turned to the Jews who were criticizing him and asked him, who is the neighbor? Jesus says, now who do you say is the neighbor? And the Jews had to admit the one that helped him is the neighbor. Who is my neighbor? 
My neighbor is the one in need. And so Jesus asked the Jews, who proved neighbor? The one who showed mercy, they said. And he said, do likewise. That's God's word to this church. Do likewise. Third, Paul says, build like Christ in verse 35. Remembering the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Unless all work together, this church will struggle. Be generous. Be giving. Give of your tithes and your offerings. Give a compliment to those who need a compliment. Give a thank you to those who need a thank you. Give a card of recognition. Give a phone call. Do a text message. When you give, you will receive blessings, Jesus said, and that will build up the church. Your spiritual muscles will grow. Paul concludes with a final word in verses 36 through 38. And when he had spoken thus, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And they all wept and embraced Paul and kissed him, sorrowing most of all because of the word that he had spoken, that they should see his face no more. And they brought him to the ship. This is the final word. The time has come today for you as a church to escort Keith and Debbie, Ginny and I to the ship on which God has booked us. Most of us like perfect endings. Most of us like poems that rhyme, but not all poems rhyme. Some stories don't have a clear plot. Life is about having to change. It is about seizing the moment and making the best of that moment. It is about not knowing what's going to happen next. With faith in Jesus Christ, we don't need to know what's going to happen next. We simply need to follow in his steps. Whatever God calls us to do, he will empower us to accomplish. And so I leave you with Paul's benediction to the Corinthians. Finally, brethren, farewell. Mend your ways. Heed my appeal. Agree with one another. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will go with you. Amen.